Um, Johnny's just left, but that was great, because Johnny's actually set me up uh, rather well. I didn't come here today under any assumption that I'd be the first person to use the word seamless. <laughs> I'm sure you've heard it a lot today, because it is clearly the word that everybody's talking about. I just have finished the project working for it, I've rigged all this on actually helping to articulate their brand position, which has been the most fascinating project, because they are like, aren't any other retailer I've ever come across. The idea that in their constitution, which can only be changed if by an act of parliament, uh, Sweden Lewis put it into Parliament and says this cannot be changed unless Parliament allows it to do so. They say they will only make sufficient profit and they, only, they believe that consumer, uh, the staff and customers come before profit throughout their entire uh, uh, ethos. They were telling me a story about how this lady came into their store uh, in Sloan Square and she'd been shopping with them for years and she brought like a night in. And she just said, you know, this is not right, it's clinging to me, I don't particularly like it. And she had like dirty stains in the collar. She'd obviously had it for about six months. And she said, I just don't, I just don't like it. And I, I want you to take it back. And they did, even though I had a Marks and Spencer's label in it. <laughs> <laughs> their view was, she shot with us, her son's going to shop with us, her grandchildren are going to shop with us. Brilliant. To change in 19, really, what does it matter? At the end of the day, we only care about our staff, because they're happy. Anyway, yeah, that's a, a quick aside. But Johnny has set me up rather well, as I said, because I wanted to, as well as touch on some of the things we've just been talking about there in the, in the introduction, just talk to you about some thoughts we've had about seamless retail. We are a design company, hopefully, as you know. If you want to know any more about it, I've left some brochures outside. That's the sales bit over. Um, we work here, here, Europe, in the Middle East, in India, in Asia, in America. Um, and we work with traditional retailers, so the Morrisons of the world, or the Target in America. We work with non-traditional retailers, people who have lots of retail that are not what you might call traditional retailers, like all the photos, who are a communication provider. And then we work with people who have products but want to sell their products through other retailers. What's become clear to me as the creative director, as the world has changed, and I think that um, Johnny was putting it very well in terms of his even experience of trying to buy a uh, barbecue, is that the idea that Pitch can rock up and say, here's an MDF shell, what's your brief? often what we used to do, i.e. that was shop design, can no longer be how our creatives behave. Our creatives have got to start to think differently. So we began a process about three or four years ago looking at this, and I'll just, if I can, take you through some of this, and forgive me if I am repeating some of the things that you've already seen today, but our view about the customer journey, something we've studied for many, many years, which was often something that started when you crossed the threshold of the door and then <coughs> when you went to the till, Started off something very simple, simple. It's become incredibly splintered in our view. Again, we're not the first person today to use this word, but it needs to become a lot more seamless. We had shops, so it was great. We knew what to do with these things. You go in, you pick up products, you put them in a basket, you walk up to a till, hopefully somebody smiles at you, you pay, and you go home. And we had catalogs. I remember every Christmas as a seven year old going through the littlest catalog trying to pick out one Christmas present and getting on with them. But it was always a, a rather nice idea to go through. And those were rather sweet things. The world was simple. It was a very linear and a very location-based existence. <coughs> a shop was a place you went to, and it was a very kind of straight line that you took. And I realize that this is not necessarily new stuff I'm telling you, so I'm not standing up here like I'm some kind of suit sayer. I'm just trying to put into context how we as a business, as a creative agency, have had to change about how we think. And then this is what the world looked like in 1990. That really is <laughs> Bill Gates in 1990. And only 12 months later, Tim Berners-Lee wrote a piece of code that launched the web. And on the Sun newspaper in that year, it said, the world like what? Computer web to change billions of lives. Yeah, right. They nearly didn't believe it. Um, he's enabled computer users to see documents and pictures made by others available in cyberspace. This could be huge. <laughs> Amazing how people kind of suddenly started to think that this thing might do something. And as I'm sure you've already heard today, but I'll carry on. We started getting internet retail, so that you go through internet. And we have famous examples of Google Mill, the famous company that managed to go through 135 million pounds worth of investment in 18 months, and they go bust. It was all the property that, well, example, the worst ever, uh, hopefully nobody knew who it was, was involved, but it was one of the worst ever slash you could do it. Shopping, it was hard to navigate, it was complicated, it was everything you probably shouldn't be. But there were two businesses, Amazon and eBay, that began in 1995, so only three or four years after Tim Berners-Lee wrote the original Code. Amazon obviously created by Jeff Bezos, and eBay created by a guy called, a guy called Pierre Omidar on the uh, west coast of America. He started it because there were some things he wanted to get rid of, and he thought that maybe the internet might be a way of doing it, so he created this thing called eBay. 
I don't know if any of you know, because it's a great story. His first thing he ever sold was a broken laser pointer. Those things you often use in presentations. And it was broken, and several people bid for it. When the guy who won it won it, he felt so guilty that he emailed me and said, you do realize it's broken, don't you? And he said, yes, I collect broken laser pointers. <laughs> <laughs> and he thought, you know, this way, he thought, fuck me, I want to go. <laughs> And that was the birth of retail and internet. <laughs> you know, and it's a kind of an interesting insight into the fact that it just kind of fulfills. And if you've read the book about the long tail, it talks about how it's that, it's that diagram that goes like that. And over here, businesses are set up to sell the top 10 and top 20 of everything. But over here, the internet, if you're into African panpipe music done by a particular bloke, and there's only one example in the world, it's available on the internet. Broken laser pointers, I don't think this room's big enough. It's kind of spread <laughs> somewhere over there. So you get a horrible slide, take the image, but you know what I'm saying. You're getting shot all the way to off. You then say, well, okay, e-commerce is going to kill physical space, something that people were discussing just a second ago. Some of the figures from JP Morgan saying that e-commerce is set to grow by 2013, almost uh, a third again, into 930 billion. And Rupert, the funny thing is, at the same time, retail space has actually increased 40 million square feet in 2003 to 130 million square feet last year. Um, now, the argument that e-commerce is killing physical retail simply is not true. That level of growth in retail space, as we know, is clearly in developing markets, it's not in established markets like ours or America. In fact, brands like Staples are cutting back on <coughs> their retail space. They're not cutting back on the amount of physical retail they intend to do, but because they don't need huge warehouses, because distributions have gone elsewhere, they are converting their spaces into kind of office experiences where you can learn how to build your own small office, etc. So they're using their retail space in different ways, which is why, as a retail design agency, it's not simply easy enough just to go along and say, here's an MDS shelf, what's the brief? You've got to start thinking about what you do with physical space. Um, and then these things came along, um, which everybody now has, and then later these things came along, smartphones, um, and some more statistics about the amount of smartphones in the world. And you'll see things like Google Wallet, you mentioned we're working with barter cards at the moment on the whole idea of contactless payment, payment through mobiles. I mean, quite fascinating things that you'd be able to do. And also, they're developing budget smartphones so that everybody in the world, God bless them, can get to play Angry Birds, which is <laughs> the reason why you have a smartphone in the first place. Maybe you've seen this, but if you haven't, it's quite a nice thing. experience around the things you're trying to sell. And just because you're a retail shop doesn't mean you can't be doing things like this. Just because you're a retail designer who's really good at MDF shelves doesn't mean you haven't got the mental capacity to think about things like that. And that's what we're going through and have been for, say, the last two or three years. And I think, going back to some of the things that Johnny was saying, and I'm not wishing to take a side swipe at anybody, but I think when businesses start to <coughs> break down the silos, another phrase you'll have heard probably again today, then I think you start to get much more of that thinking where other ideas spark up other ideas. Um, so then you get the birth of apps with smartphones. And there are apps for everything now, as you know. Price Grabber Research last year was saying that consumers have about 23 apps each on average, three of which are shopping related. They're getting regular coupons, <coughs> prices when they're in store, people are using barcode scanners, um, things like Red Laser. But the idea that you can also pick up a product in store and scan it, not to find out where else you can buy it cheaper, which often people do, but also to get recipe ideas. The idea you can use that for multi baskets and selling more products. QR codes are everywhere. Um, scared the hell out of my mum, but she did try to use one and it didn't work. And then she did try to use one and it did work and she was taken to a porn site. But, um, <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, just kept going back to that shop. <laughs> um, and then things like AR, all the kind of use of augmented reality, standing in the street and looking across the street and seeing ideas and coupons and sales. 
and we've just been talking about it, but there are things that are happening in the social space. Again, as I'm sure you talked about already today, even though I wasn't here earlier, but the idea of credit or, or recognition for the amount of social activity you're having and the way in which retailers maybe reward you for that. Uh, although, you know, I have to say, just because you like a brand doesn't mean you like a brand, so you can tick the particular box. So these are, in our view, as well as a shopping tool, these are some of the, obviously the future shopping tools. So as we're thinking about that, and thinking about how it went for me, very simple, you went to the shop, you picked something in the basket, you paid for it. The world has become much more fractured, and in a way for retailers, traditional retailers, bricks and mortar retailers, are much more formidable. Where do you <coughs> pin the tail on the donkey? What do you choose to do? Do you do great big things in a piazza? Do you do Facebook? Do you do Twitter? Do you look up there? And so the list goes on in terms of what you can do. At the same time that we're looking at this, and because we're a retail agency, obviously you need to look at the consumers. And I, I hope this, um, this uh, has some cut through with you guys, because it's certainly the thing that has completely changed the way that we and quite a few of our clients now are looking at um, designing for consumers. The internet and all that it brought with it since 91, when Bill Gates looked like a young lad, uh, has meant that our states of mind have changed. And whilst I'm not wishing to say that whatever consumers you have as, as retail businesses out there, Gen Y, I mean the kids, all the various typologies I'm sure you have, in our view there are three universal mind states that exist across the whole consumer's globe. Consumers are either in a state of dreaming, they're in a state of exploring, or they're in a state of locating. And when you take it down to those three, it starts to become very interesting when you start to look at your physical estate, your online activity, etc., to see what you're actually doing to appeal to these people. Very quickly, in a dreaming mind state, you're saying, I'm kind of unfocused, I'm open to experiences, I'm open to storytelling, inspire me, challenge me, entertain me. I want, I want some real insight into some of the ideas I'm having. I see a guy on a mountain bike. Wouldn't it be great this weekend to go mountain bike with the kids in the forest? Now I start thinking about getting a mountain bike, a bit like Johnny, within 10 minutes sitting on the bus, I'm suddenly an expert on mountain biking and tents and camper stoves, and before I know it, I'm off into a fantasy land. Exploring is when you think, okay, I'm now a bit more open-minded, but I'm more casually focused now. I want to play with things, I want to try things, I want, to, I want you to show me ideas, I want to explore what this product's about. And then finally, I know what I need. I need a X Weber barbecue. I just need to find it. I need to find it quickly. I need to let you know if there's any service deals you can do with me, et cetera, et cetera. <laughs> Those for us are the things that really start to cut through. The problem with it is, is traditional retailers, retail in general, has been always set up here. It's always stores have been laid out to help you to get to products really, really, really quickly. And the problem is, most of that kind of stuff is going to go online. People are going to start stocking up with commodities online. So the idea of a retail format helps you get quickly to a product and find it, it might not be what we need for the future. Um, I'm not suggesting it's wrong, I'm just saying that the, the internet is much more exciting for people who are dreaming or exploring. So what we're interested in is that we should start looking here more than we currently do. Dream, uh, discovery is all about a new age discovery. Respondents said that 90% or more of their online shopping time was actually spent researching products. Now, it doesn't mean they're not then going to the physical store, why are they not researching products in store? Why are we not encouraging people to come in and spend time in store researching products? They may leave and shop online or whatever, but that's just one of the things that we have to contend with today as we design our stores. My understanding, people may out there may correct me if they're wrong, is that actually sales in Apple stores are actually going down. Apple don't mind. They actually don't mind where they sell their products because their value continues to rise. They're the most valuable company in the world. Their value is actually continuing to increase. They continue to sell more products than they have before. The stores were only actually ever there to allow you to touch the product. The fact they were a royal way of success was almost an incremental bonus for them. Um, so this idea of discovery, touch, and play. So just a very interesting example from Lego, which we've looked at in a lot of detail. We've worked with this client quite a bit. You know, wonderful brand. Lego, if you don't know, is made up of two words, uh, Scandinavian words, which is lay dot, which means play well. Lego was suffering towards the end of uh, the beginning of the 2000s because they were the toy of the century, but it was the last century. Kind of, kind of lost their way, and they were the first to admit it. They, they've come back really, really strong. I mean, their stores, if you look at them now, both in-store, out-of-store, and online, you know, their stores are fascinating places. Uh, this is some of their latest brand stores. Um, what they did is they've taken away over 25% of the merchandise, and sales have gone up by 35%. They've created in the center of the store, we did this with them, what's called a lounge, where you can just play with the product. You can take any product off the shelf, play with it. Obviously, this pick a brick wall, which was designed like a pick sweet thing, but uh, it's restocked two or three times a day. People are buying Lego with a scoop and a paper bag. 
and just helping yourself off the ground. And they're now thinking of doing one that's entirely dedicated to body parts. Um, because the little minifigures are so popular, so you get a, a scoop of heads, a scoop of weights. <laughs> and then going back to Johnny's example, you know, you get wonderful things like this from Lego City. I hope everybody's seen this. If you haven't, it's absolutely amazing. <laughs> Very simply, there's a camera at the top one that picks up an AR code on the top, or, and then the thing gets built, the drawing goes up, the camera goes across. Absolutely fantastic. The interesting point I think about it um, is this is not what it's To coin a phrase, it's a child's play. I mean, this kid doesn't need a description of what to do. He picks a box up, he goes and he sees somebody else do it, and he goes and does it. Now, uh, my kids did it themselves, actually, in the store in the new uh, Westfield, and they picked up an airport, and literally this plane took off, and my youngest one ducked. <laughs> it was so real. Now, imagine you go into a supermarket, and you pick up a can of baked beans, and you hold it up, and then there's somebody, a chef pops up, and tells you 15 different things you can do with baked beans you never thought of doing before. Or a shoe shop, somebody shows you the best way to mix it with these types of socks. This tie, these trousers. I mean, this is this is exploring. This is how people learn to explore. And this shouldn't just be something that happens online. And now, this is this is an actual piece of um, technology, um, of a very friendly technology, is now being rolled out across the Lego estate. You then look at their other installs. So they've got third-party retail. They've got things that they put into other retailers. They've got their play table that go anything from doctor's surgeries, whatever. So that's what they do in store. And then out of store, you know, you've got things like Lego Land, which is, if anything, the biggest flag and the biggest celebration of Lego brand. That kind of you can't help but pop into the shop on the way out. But you've got things like Miniland, you've got things like the rides. You then go continue out of store, you've got what's kind of related merchandise there they're producing. These are their billboards that they do near their shops. They're all entirely made out of Lego. They're not paper printed, they're all made out of Lego. <coughs> There's street art going on around the world that they are partially funding, but also sponsoring, as well as people just doing it off their own. So this Lego is going to be a manufacturer of bricks. Suddenly, an idea that we have stores, we have lots of things out of store, and then don't get me started online. You've got lego.com, you've got legoshop.com, you've got Lego games, you've got just about every film that has been made into the Lego game, the Xbox, and Wii, and PlayStation. Um, you've got Lego Club, Lego ID, the network, digital builders, apps, and I'll keep, I can keep going, as you know. And then they have Facebook, obviously. Uh, but with Facebook, you can choose the different bits of Lego that you want to be into and follow that. Same on YouTube, you can look at different films on YouTube. The point I'm really simply making, which is where we changed as a business, is to say, if you take a very simple matrix of dreaming, exploring, locating, in-store, out-of-store, and online, and use that as your creative basis, for thinking about where you're going to take your business and your retail operation, it becomes a much more liberating way of looking. Because there may be an idea that you have that absolutely captures somebody who's in a dreaming mind state who are out of store. It could become a great idea in store to help people explore more. Whereas previously, in the previous world, and I'm, I'm, I'm overemphasizing to make the point, turning up and saying, here's an MDF shelf off the brief can no longer be. So when you look at Lego, these are all the things that they do for the dreaming in-store, out-of-store, and online. These are all the things they do from an exploring point of view, and these are all the things from a locating point of view. So perfectly they can capture from an in-store point of view all the things they can do from dreaming to right through to actually making the purchase. From dreaming to actually finding products when you actually leave Legoland, from dreaming in, on, online, but actually buying something with an app <coughs> on the web. So we find that quite an interesting way of looking at it. And then finally, the point is we also should be looking here because this is where we can build interactions with consumers. Are they okay for time? Yeah, are they? Yes, fine. And this is where we want people to, who've not really got an idea what they want necessarily, but it's kind of inspire, inspiring, challenging, entertaining. The idea that when people are dreaming, they're daydreaming, you know, they're indulging in idle fantasy. When was the last time in a dream did somebody write, we want to appeal to people who are indulging in idle fantasy? And that's not what shops do, is it? Shops are supposed to place where you put products on shelves and they can buy them. Our view is, is that maybe uh, to make shops even more exciting places to go to, we should think about this. We should also think about something I've already touched on, this idea of people shopping in the mind. The 
sitting on a bus within a second and looking on your smart device and you're suddenly off in a wonderful world of, of shopping. This is a shop we've just completed in India. This was the shop before. This is Asian paint, they're the largest producer of paint in uh, India. Uh, they have a network of between 23 <coughs> to 26,000 stores. Um, I'll just show you very quickly this film. shown how different colors are sophisticated or relaxed, etc. to show how color and space work, to show how different lighting works, so you can click the lighting in various spaces. There's even a color chef who will actually mix you with an entire palette of colors in your home. Or you can step through and bring a picture of your interior of your home, they'll put it full size on a wall like this, and they'll recolor your walls for you, so you can see what your room will look like if you pick those colors. This was the first one we did. We've now just completed the story in Delhi, which is where it's entirely made digital. So uh, you may have seen in the film, what you do is you go around collecting things you're interested in, you then give it to the person at the end, they then print it out as your own magazine, you can take it out, <coughs> and also they'll email it to you as a digital format. Um, so they're color consultants. Um, and they've now started to use apps whereby you can even photograph things that you're really, really interested in, keep it as your little Pinterest, so you can keep it as your collection. You can Facebook it, you can send it to friends, and then start to build your entire color project um, online and then take it into the store to share with the people once you get into the space. This has been hugely successful for them. Um, I, I said before that they, um, these stores that they designed, they don't sell anything. They're entirely about dreaming, about making your home wonderful. Um, the point being though, the shop I showed you right at the beginning has now been converted into this. This will be the 23,000 store that the sales of these stores up by over 35% because it's been a simple case of we've, we've, we've um, helped them with their dreaming and exploring so that when they need to go locate, they're doing in much more cost efficient stores such as this. And these are, there are some ideas in there, but they're basically just paint shops where you go and buy tins of paint. So we took them from, from this, but I think what's remarkable is in no more than three years, they've gone from that to something like this, to a store that doesn't sell anything, to 23,000 stores were sold have gone up by 35%. But they've leapfrogged us because they've become entirely <coughs> seamless. They've got digital magazines, they've got iPad magazines, they've got things that you can take home and then you can actually then order that online or come and do your walk for you. They've got things like Facebook sharing and decorating apps. And I think going back to what we said before, this is, 
they're embracing seamless retail in a way that um, we're not witnessing the same way we say it's more the traditional markets that we work in. So our view is that seamless is about being consistent and coordinated. It's not about doing everything. It's about making sure, as I said right at the beginning, that we think about people who are dreaming, exploring, or thinking. We think about in-store, out-of-store, or online equally in the early conceptual stages. You use a matrix such as this, and you fill them all in with ideas <coughs> that clients is currently doing or could potentially do. And then really ask questions like, what are you doing to inspire people who are dreaming? What are you currently doing to engage people who are exploring? And actually, as I said right at the beginning, what else can you do to make locating a pleasure? Because locating is not going to go away. It's not, it's not going to be the, uh, the thing you tend to forget about. Well, that's it. Tim, that was great. Thank you very much. Indeed.